thank you so much for the invitation. <coughs> it has been great so far, so I've, I've really benefited from all the presentations and all the contributions of all of you. It's always a great pleasure to uh, be with people who take ethnography seriously, uh, which is not a uh, taken for granted thing, even in anthropology, not to speak about other um, <laughs> social sciences. So um, that, that to kind of you know, trigger some kind of uh, positive feelings in your help. I have to say in advance two things, and that is firstly that this is probably a really bad come down for everybody, not because we were out yesterday, but because it's not going to be as sexy and as, um, you know, political uh, as some of the other presentations. Uh, I'm going to make my point nevertheless, and secondly, I am an imposter. Yeah? I'm an imposter because um, I'm not a migrant migration person. Um, I'm just a migrant myself. <clears throat> There's a question, of course, whether anyone can say of themselves that their site is not affected by migration. That's my only redeeming feature, so to speak. Um, and as I said before, I have done all my field work, which started in 94 in Calcutta in India. Now, um, I'm also technologically challenged, actually, which is here for everybody. And you can already see this is um, the, at the eastern um, uh, tip of. Um, the northern part of India and um, at the border to Bangladesh, what is today Bangladesh, the vast majority of the population are Bengali speakers, which is also the kind of community in inverted commerce that I work with, mostly, not exclusively. Calcutta is a 50 million city, so it is a large city that would fall under the bracket of a metropolis. It, is, uh, it was the colonial center of India, so it had a huge history, has a huge 300 years long history of migration because it didn't exist before, uh, let's say roughly 1800, okay? Um, in that sense, for India, it is a young city. In the sense of colonial agglomerations, it is not a young city at all. It's one of the oldest cities and very importantly, it is in terms of not only its economic and political history, but also its importance for writing and thinking about colonialism and so on and so forth, one of the main sites. And you can already see that the physical physicality of the city itself, its history, and its importance in debates around, you know, how do we do social sciences and so on, they overlap a lot. So a lot of the big names that you may be familiar with, and I'm just kind of going for Parker Chatterjee, for instance, they are born and brought up in the city, they are part of the Bengali middle class, they are very much raised in that kind of environment. The <coughs> thinking comes back to the city very often. Some people say that Papa Chatterjee's writing is actually not about colonial, oh. but just about Bengal. I think <laughs> that is probably pushing it a bit. But there is a lot of stuff that is free-floating that you have already confronted that is related to Calcutta, but you're probably not aware of it, whether you like it or not. But we can discuss that. Now, a bit more pedestrian, what I'm trying to do uh, today is really way out of my comfort zone because most of my work is with those people, um, um, families, on gender and kinship stuff, or it is on urban politics in Calcutta itself, a lot of it is on Maoists um, and the history of Naxalite uprisings in uh, West Bengal. Um, what I'm going today, and that is Esther's fault really, is going to confront something that I tried to avoid for a long time. And that is really the interaction of Calcutta with my um, site of origin, which is Germany. I got to know a lot of people in Calcutta while I was working there, but also in Germany when I was involved in NGOs, um, who were uh, from Calcutta, who were mostly male, who were mo okay, almost exclusively engineers. And of course there is a kind of nice overlap here but with the kind of family and social class formation and standing of those I work with in the city because they are very middle class, right? It's not kind of neat, but it, it is overlap. And I have never actually um, written about that kind of interaction and what that has to do with me and what actually happens here um, because I thought like, you know, I'm interested in Calcutta, I'm not interested in these Indo-Germans, inverted commas, and their lives in the same way, right? I thought that was like migration studies, so I'm not really into that. So Esther then pushed me and I thought like, okay, I've been engaging with that population, if you want to say it that, um, with that question, with those lives, with those families for over 20 years now, why don't I just look at that a bit more carefully? This is one reason that has to do with it. So that's all Esther's fault and my own migration history. <clears throat> the second reason, and that is a bit more um, social science-y, 
is really that, of course, my subject is the middle class, the formation of middle classes, global middle classes and research on that. Um, and in a way, these kind of migrants have come back to haunt me and the question of the middle class. And I'm telling you why, because um, like any other big metropolis in India, they, Calcutta underwent a transformation which is expressed in this name change, in the official name change from Calcutta into Kolkata, which is the Bengali pronunciation of Calcutta, or the, uh, Calcutta is the English pronunciation of Kolkata, um, just as Chennai was Madras and um, Mo, uh, Bombay became Mumbai and so on. This is not just a matter of naming, this is a matter of, uh, this is a programmatic issue, right? Because what happened there is a complex process of, you know, re- uh, claiming these cities as Indian, but at the same time of a different India than the Calcutta used to be. I'm not going to go into the detail of that, but um, this is also materialized these changes yeah, in massive big urban restructuring pro programs, yeah, which started with creations of um, new policies, economic policies, which I gloss over as liberalization, liberalization of the Indian economy. And in a nutshell, really in a nutshell, that means opening of the Indian economy to foreign investors, new flows of money. The Indian economy was extremely protected, right? India has had, had a very long history of being protective of its economic undertakings, not dis, uh, disembedded from global flows, but the uh, state had a massive influence and so on and so forth. Why is that relevant for that story of these migrants in Germany? Two things. One is these main migrants were sent abroad at a time when the city was in a massive downward spiral. Yeah. <laughs> these were the mostly young graduates who in the 60s and 70s were sent by their families to study in Germany. Germany at the time was looking for engineers. There was a lack of engineers, especially in the 60s, actually in the 70s, kind of fizzled out. Yeah. Um, and so there was a, a kind of agreement that it would be a good idea for Germany to get these uh, well-educated young Indians, you know, to work in big montane industries, mostly steel and um, related industries in the area where I come from, which is the Ruhr area. Um, so a lot of them centered around these uh, big industrial sites in the uh, Ruhr and in the, in the Saarland, and then some of them did better and went to work for BMW and so on and so forth. But really big, good jobs, Good, uh, good education, very often then post education done in technical universities and so on. Very much like an elite migration story, okay? Um, these migrants then, um, very often marry, okay? Not all of them, but a lot of them marry. And what I'm particularly interested in is, a lot of them marry, not surprisingly, German women, right? So there is a kind of uh, interesting story here of the, of, of marriage between people who are of very different backgrounds, again, you know, you like, that's not really interesting. It is interesting because, of course, if you look at current migrants, a lot of them, software engineers who go to Germany as well, um, a lot of them will take spouses, right? A lot of them will be couples who have married in India already. There's a story about that, which has to do with families doing that on purpose, but there's also a story about that young people not not uh, actually wanting to expose themselves to these intermarriages, okay? So there is a directionality here, yeah? To prevent particular stories that are circulating. Now, um, what I'm trying to discuss here are some of the issues that the ethnographic study of migration uh, puts forward, which is like <laughs> elite migration. What is the status of studies of elite migration? Yeah, are we only interested in marginalized communities? What is the, st the status of that? Not only in terms of uh, what can be learned from it, but also what does it contribute to broader analysis and conceptual developments? Yeah, is there any benefit in looking at these rich people? Yeah, at these affluent people, right? Um, and their border crossings and the way that they make homes in different sites. Okay. Secondly, um, there is a broader question here about social transformations in both sites. I'm more interested in the sending sites, so to speak. I'm interested in the transformations in Calcutta. I'm not so much interested in the German part that other people have tackled. That's not my job, I think. Um, and I mean, in the, broadly speaking, I would always frame that in terms of you know what does uh, how does this also reflect a large social transformations to do with new flows of money, new flows of, of knowledge, new flows of people, and so on and so forth. Capitalist penetration. Okay. Um, now the background of this um, kind of homemaking that I'm going to look at, which is really these Indo-German couples coming as pensioners 
to Calcutta and investing in flats, in apartments, right? And this is just a kind of blueprint of that, you know? Um, <coughs> so <coughs> the background is really of that is that uh, these couples, these families, have a long-standing relationship with the city, which initially didn't interest me because I thought, okay, you know, I'm working with these families here who have a son or a nephew or a cousin or something like that, you know, living in Germany, and they told me all these stories, yeah, you know, we know Germans, you know, because my cousin's uh, uh, um, wife, she is German, and they come and visit us, and she is such a great person, and blah, 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 so on. And I went like, yeah, but can you just, can we come back to, you know, talking about love marriages in Calcutta? <laughs> so a bit like that. Um, and so um, I didn't really listen that attentively to those stories. And here's a lesson for those doctorate students. I still wrote them down. So I can go back to them. So even if you think something is irrelevant for what I'm now interested in, it's always good to make a, a note because you might find at one point that this becomes really interesting and important to, to, um, to your conceptual framework as much as you know, a new topic that you're looking for. So what I'm trying to do um, by looking at this is to unpack some of these historical, economic, and social entanglements, um, as I see them now, that in a way complicate the idea not only that people have this linear transcript, like you, know, you come somewhere and there you make a home, and our job as ethnographers is to look at what do they do, yeah? how do they understand that process of homemaking. But of course, that there is very often, yeah, and of course for elite populations much more easy, this constant back and forth, this constant renegotiating, re where are we going to stay? What are we going to do? Where will we send our kids to study? Lots of you will have that experience yourselves, right? Not all of us are marginal in the sense that we come to a place and we have to stay there because we don't get a visa for something else, yeah? So these renegotiations, um, which are felt and experienced as very individual, and they will also be retold as individual. Then we decided to build a house in Germany. Then, 50 years later, we decided to invest in a flat in Calcutta, right? Are, um, of course, very often, so to speak, a shared experience within a group of people, yeah? In other words, it is not an individual couple that is going to invest in this apartment. There's a whole group of people who do that at, the similar, at a similar point in their lives and a similar point in the history of the city and of India, yeah? Now, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> Mm -hmm. thing. Um, how did that come about? Why is that of more importance than just saying, okay, let's look at these family lives, which is perfectly fine and very interesting, you know, and what happened there? This is important because the Indian government made this whole question of let's have these people return, yeah, let's make them invest in India into a broadly rolled out massive project. That is part of the general idea of regenerating metropolitan areas. So all this global city stuff, you know, like with flows of money and the liquidation, liquidation, liquid uh, capital and so on, applies here too. Yeah, as you can see, the, there's more, more players than just governments in these processes of homemaking. Another thing that I'm really interested in: what beyond the family is really structuring and really. In, implied in processes of homemaking in different places. Yeah? Homes are not made in that kind of spectrum of society. They're not made just by people and putting a cooker in and deciding on interior design, which is also important. They're also made by players like banks. Yeah? Can I get a loan? Who is allowed to get a loan? Right? Uh, that then relates directly back to questions of citizenship. Yeah? So these Indo-German couples, pensioners, well off, Children were settled, right? They will never stop telling you about that. Yeah? Children are all doctors and engineers and blah blah blah. They're not, you know, mention them. Um, come back and feel the urge, feel persuaded to invest in an apartment. Now, these buyers of apartments, of that kind of home, yeah, they are not just there. It's a bit like labor studies. They're not just laborers just because they're people. Yeah? They were made in different kinds of sites. Yeah? First, of course, in the migration experience of being a successful migrant in Germany, earning a lot of money, having extra, yeah? having cash. Yeah? Secondly, by keeping in touch with the city, keeping in touch with relatives, 
uh, having an involvement, um, very much this idea of you know, a transnational community the, and a diaspora because of this constant involvement, this constant uh, synchronicity, so to speak, between living there and living with, through, through and with Kakata and the family in Kakata. And thirdly, and that is really important here, that, that, that change that takes place with these new policies. That is why I chose this title, and this is where you get the most. Because actually when you talk to people, particularly the men, a lot of the narrative will focus on investment. Yeah? So homemaking as investment, um, real transfers of money, but also the question of, you know, what the hell? Yeah? Why would I work? Why would I buy a home? in a shit place like Calcutta, okay? It has terrible climate, trend comes close second, <laughs> like really humid, yeah? You kind of go to a shower, you come out and you think like, oh, I should have a shower, yeah? It has terrible infrastructure, yeah? These homes will not really gain in value as much as a home that you would buy in Munich or Frankfurt or even like Kassel, yeah? <laughs> so like, this is no comparison. Their children will not live there, ever. Their children will not live in those apartments, right? So why would you do that? And so in order to rope that in, but also tying into this new identity that these couples collectively, so to speak, uh, acquire, and of which homemaking here becomes a massive part, there is the talk of investing in the homeland, in India, so as a national task, as a citizenship question, but also as a middle class question, that is probably my point, you know? This kind of thinking about homes, as investment, yeah? as something that can be liquidized at any point, as something that has a value beyond <laughs> the beautiful stuff that we talked about yesterday, about this, the regimes of care and so on, yeah? um, as something that is essential for you to not only show off that you are a successful migrant, but also to keep that going, yeah? that image, yeah? where you can invite people to come and see you when you are in the city. Something like a second home, which is of course the case here, yeah? where you go for winter holidays. Yeah, Fagata's climate is quite acceptable during the winter. Yeah? Where whole industries emerged in the city around those collective uh, desires and these narratives yeah? of that is the figure that I described in much detail here, the homemaking of NRIs, a category that, that the Indian government precisely formulated, a category of differentiated citizenship for those people who are what is called non-resident Indians, which in itself, of course, is a very interesting term. Yeah? In brief, you could not invest in India legally. There's a lot of black money, obviously. <laughs> that also comes into that story. But uh, in brief, you could not invest in India if uh, you lived abroad earlier. Okay? You could not buy property in particular, but you could also not invest in companies and do startups. And anything, of, anything was very good. It was difficult enough if you were proper Indian, but if you lived abroad, it was next to impossible. Right? The Indian government then in the course of these liberalization policies said, okay, we have to get investors in who are the best investors. This is like our foreign population, so to speak. We wrote them back in. We give them a new status. We differentiate citizenship, not only to include those Indo-German couples that I'm talking about, yeah, those married people who actually one of them stand from Kakara itself, but also their children by saying a person of Indian origin, which is a different category, the children for the children of these people. Anyway. The NRI in the 1980s and 90s gradually emerges in my own fieldwork as a figure of um, f fantasy, as a, as a fantasmogastic fant 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 figure. Like everybody speaks about these NRIs, but you never meet them really, because nobody would say of themselves, I'm an NRI. Yeah? People would say, like, I live in Cologne. They wouldn't say, oh, I'm an NRI. It was almost like a weird category yeah? that you couldn't really place, a bit like green card holder or something, which is not a person, yeah? Um, the NRI category then becomes very much regurgitated and publicized in Indian media, specifically in cinema, in films. Hindi films in the 80s and 90s start actually figuring these people who are living abroad, who used to be traitors, portrayed as traitors to the nation and outsiders, they suddenly become depicted as family members, as people who return who have this desire to be deshi, and so lots of films start with deshi, 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 deshi means of the country, of the nation. Um, and um, they, uh, they, the, the idea of that you might be an NRI, and that this is a positive thing, yeah, and that is a status, becomes really very much part of 
family life in the sense that um, the transfer of money is possible, to set up a business with your brother, cousin, sister, whatever is possible. Um, it is possible to uh, support family members directly without sending money in, in, in hidden ways, right? So you can actually you know, say, I'm going to support your studies in Chennai and direct these transfer money. So money plays a huge role in these kinds of um, homemaking exercises here. But again, you know, in a very middle class manner, in the manner of I invest here, I will get something out of her. Questions of value become really important. The whole city is transformed in that image. New sites of leisure emerge, yeah? malls emerge, food courts emerge, restaurants emerge, um, a whole kind of new, uh, newly designed space for um, NRIs, but obviously also the local middle class, yeah? um, to enjoy themselves, to have the lives that they are looking for. And in the course, um, uh, as, as uh, Michele pointed at, uh, hinted at, uh, you know, of course, a lot of poor populations are displaced. I knew this was going to happen. Um, poor, poor populations are displaced, they are evicted, they are marginalized, they are made invisible, they lose their livelihoods and so on and so forth, very often quite directly related to those property developments, to the real estate market. Okay? Now, what's the backstory of that? That's all very kind of political science. What's the backstory of that? The people I... Okay, the people I looked at... Um, they, they don't tell the story in that way. They don't say, oh, you know, we remade the city in our image, right? And therefore it's now a place which we call home. First of all, the male in, in that couple would always have Calcutta as his, his home, yeah? What is interesting is that his wife now also is prepared to invest in this. Why would she? Like, why would she want to go? And there's then a whole story which has to do with my work on kinship and family and middle classness, which has two sides to it. One is, very importantly, most of these couples have a history of visiting the city very, very often and living with family, okay? And with all the tensions that this creates, living with your family for two months with small children, you know, being bossed around by a mother-in-law for the German wife, um, experiences which are now very often nostalgically framed, but where, where very often also the tensions and conflicts come out and the bitterness is, is, is really very much fun, especially, of course, for these um, for these uh, daughters-in-law, yeah, who are you know coming into a situation which is not only entirely different from what they would consider appropriate family life and relationships. The spaces themselves were very often cramped, and I described that in the paper. That you know, um, the story is we went there, and there was this railway quarters. Railway quarters are ho is housing for railway employees, yeah, and there were eight of us living there. So for two months. Yeah, there were eight of us living in two rooms, which is a very common story, was a very common thing for middle class families in India. So when I say middle class, I'm not saying single detached houses necessarily. What I'm saying is, you know, very often people who have decent government jobs, a railway job is, is, a, is a good job, was a good job, it's not honor, but was a good job. Um, and, you know, still, these houses were like that, yeah? And then there is this... Um, balancing, so to speak, in the narratives between some uh, something that there many of the German spouses who I focus mostly on um, um, experience as extremely warm and very social, yeah, the family, the family, extended family and comings and goings and there's always someone and so on, and at the same time as very oppressive, yeah, partly because none of them, and that is really important to realize like, and, and register as well, none of them learn Bengali properly. Ever. I haven't met a single one who learned Bengali properly, right? So there's no effort to actually, you know, integrate it that way. That is not part of that integration. Um, but also because um, there is a massive reinforcement in those short visits of very patriarchal values that come into homemaking in India as well as in Germany. So a lot of the stories that I have collected center around the fact that I married a Bengali, and they are very conservative. I have seen the hierarchies that rule their homes in India many times, yeah? And actually, when we are in Germany, yeah, I live uh, under that law, okay? In other words, there is a reinforcement of um, patriarchal relationships in both homes, uh, on, in both sides, yeah? Which is very much based on the gender division of labor. Yeah, obviously, yeah, you are the kids and, you know, here's the engineer guy who goes out. But also, and very importantly so, the sense of 
the father, and this comes back a bit to Gangnam's talk, yeah? so the law of the father, um, that is then justified in all sorts of ways. Now, what are the sites for that kind of experience, and that, what does that mean for homemaking? For homemaking, that very often means that there is an extended period of time when the idea that you could go to Calcutta and live, for instance, in a hotel, yeah. you could do that. Yeah? You don't have to kind of uh, squeeze in with your railway uh, employee <coughs> brother. Yeah? Um, is completely out of the question. And that's not a monetary issue. Right? <coughs> that is not the point. The point is that this lived everydayness of being part of the extended family is really important to both parts of that couple, even where the wives find some of it not so enjoyable. Um, because it fits in with very patriarchal gender stereotypes and family relationships. Now, I give you two more examples for the sites where that is really, really relevant. Parenting becomes one of the big issues here. Um, um, there is a very interesting trajectory in most of these marriages where the person who is the German spouse, the, the wife in that couple, is actually of a much lower social standing than the husband, right? So there's upward mobility in these, uh, in these marriages, which is very clear. Now you can ask me, well, how do you make the, that, how, how do you draw that conclusion? I draw this conclusion, and that is one of the things which comes out when you do in-depth and long-term field work, right? In a place like Calcutta. I draw this conclusion because none of the brothers who remained in Calcutta, or cousins for that matter, would have married a woman when he's an engineer who is a hairdresser or who doesn't have any employment, or has no education beyond class 10. That would have been like the weirdest marriage that would only be possible if that guy has a fault somehow, yeah? Is divorced or something like that, yeah? <laughs> okay, I can say that with, with, with uh, so to speak, on, on the back of my other research, where I work on marriage and, you know, hypogamy and these kind of very actual things. So, we have a class tra trajectory here, where in exchange for working through the issues of marrying someone who is not German and white at, in the 1960s and 70s, you gain access to social mobility, which is very much part of the story that these women tell you. Yeah? We went to Calcutta and I learned about the way they do things here, which is very often a way of, I learned about upper middle class lives. I learned about how to deal with servants. I learned that you cannot go out in Calcutta because you need to have a car, which is of course not true, but that is the kind of, you know, idea. Yeah, I learned that you do not talk to X, Y, and Z in that way. Yeah, like very often the relationships with servants are the main site for that particular kind of initiation. So a lot of these women go through an initiation not only into what they would describe as cultural difference, but actually a different kind of class section, right? That they would have not accessed in the same way easily, I'm not saying not, but not easily, um, had they remained in Germany. Yeah? This is quite an important point because actually what I'm arguing is that, where are we? Time, time. Am I good? Um, yeah, half an hour. Oh, good. Um, it is, I think, very crucial for my analysis of this particular homemaking because I do think that a lot of work, yeah, emotional work, um, effective labor, but also actual real work, yeah, keeping in touch with people, sending presents and so on, goes into um, dealing with the fact that in Germany, you know, they have to make up for this, uh, the racism that they are exposed to as a family, but also for that differential, yeah? So the aspect of women learning all the time is very much highlighted here, yeah? They are not the Bengali middle class spouse who comes back from the States and it just fits in like a glove, right? You know, because she's from the same standing and she knows and to read this. They are in a constant situation of learning how to do things properly and the homes reflect that. Um, what happens then? Um, very much, very often with children, these situations become actually much more complex because first of all, um, and I can vouch for that because I spent two years of field work with my son in Calcutta, um, there is a medley kind of habitus in these Indian expanded families which drives you nuts. Everybody has something to say about your parenting, you know, which of course is like, can get really, really annoying. There's also of course co-parenting, what we call co-parenting, where not only one person is responsible for the children, but there's a whole host of people who are responsible. 
many elders, but also servants who are very much employed to look after small children. Yeah? And again, you know, there's this process of um, these women learning this is supposed to be what they call it families do, and they pick some parts of that and say this is brilliant, I learned all that. But of course, there's also resistance. Yeah? Um, parenting in Germany is a very much, very, very, very patriarchally invested site. Yeah? Um, and it is very difficult to let go of that when that is how you were brought up. Yeah? Mom is at home, mom is responsible, nobody else is responsible. Yeah? Mom is responsible. Here is a site where we have mothers-in-law who go like, yeah, okay, what you are doing is rubbish, yeah? I tell you now how to do that, and you know, five other people will actually be also part of that, uh, feeding your child and you know, changing your child and schooling your child and you know, making them part of the family, yeah? Parenting becomes a site of conflict. Parenting becomes also a site where, again, male authority is constantly reiterated. Um, I have countless stories of, um, you see, it was always very difficult because he, in brackets, my husband, of course, he is a Bengali and, you know, he's very conservative and that's how we brought the children up, right? This narrative of, you know, I help him to be the person he is in both homes, yeah? And the children have to learn that they are different, they are constantly different because their father is not racially different, but he's just conservative, he's culturally different. And I'm enabling that. I'm enabling that in, in that space of the home in or countless ways. Through everyday practices, through uh, very rigid, very, very rigid ideas that a lot of these houses take on about moralities, particularly where girls are concerned, yeah? which is ironic because a lot of them actually get to know these Bengali students because they are doing things which in the 1960s would have probably been seen by their parents as immoral, let's face it. They become then the guardians of cultural difference through respectability and morality very much around sexual relations and so on. And, um, you cannot imagine the kind of fear you can probably. The stories that I heard that these uh, wives would replicate and reiterate and say like, oh yeah, in our house, and that's of course a, a, a performance that is not necessarily the case. In our house, such and such would never be allowed because my husband, you know him, he was so conservative, right? We couldn't do that. We would never have uh, boyfriends, girlfriends staying over or something like that. No, it, okay, but your children grew up near Cologne, yeah? That must have been odd for them. No, it wasn't, because they knew their father was strict. <laughs> okay, yeah, right. So a lot of that goes on. A lot of dragging the children back and forth goes on as well, which sometimes pans out as an, an extreme attachment of the children to the city and to those relatives, extreme in the sense that the children almost overcompensate the fact that they have these deficits in terms of you know, fitting in, in their local environment, or um, at least that there is a problem here with the way that Bengaliness is played out as just conservative restriction rather than a beautifully to be embraced language and culture. Yeah? Um, and in Canada, they compensate for that by you know, just being super cousins. These children, are, they are hyper cousins. Yeah? They, they, they are the cousins of cousins, so to speak. Yeah? Um, so they know probably vastly more about the lives of their cousins with whom they grew up on these short visits. Um, and their homes, they know always exactly where their homes were, when they moved, who lived there, when, when and how, which festivities they, and so on and so forth. So there's a very strong attachment to that. Um, but of course, these children are not ever going to live in them. That is, is not the point, that is, this attachment is not to do with you know, them going back here. In other words, the question of you know, being in two places at one, of course now with the technologies in particular, is enhanced, but even before that time, there's a very strong feeling that you know, these cousins in Calcutta, they are very close and we are, re we are enacting this Bengaliness by being super cousins, yeah? Hyper cousins. Stephen got too much for a lot. Um, good. What else is happening in these homes? Um, this is Celia, one of my um, comments, and that's obviously me. Uh, in December, um, who else is there? Lots of grey hair people, yeah. Um, <coughs> so, um, a lot of this um, homemaking is very just average Indian middle class, yeah? Apart from the Christmas tree, a lot of Indian families would have Christmas trees, yeah? Um, they go into any festival if it gives you a holiday. So, you know, like Christmas is fine, then you, do, so you don't do it. Never, as a Hindu family, but um, there's all sorts of decorations, and you know, and uh, and there's also, of course, a ritualized kind of way of going through those 
visits. These visits are highly ritualized uh, things. So you come normally, as a pensioner now of course, you come in October, yeah, you have already nowadays with the technologies, you know, have set up hundreds of appointments, not hundreds, but really specific appointments with very specific people. Um, you kind of tick these relatives off very much in a hierarchical manner. Yeah? So you have to first go to the, to the oldest cousin, ideally, if they are there and so on and so forth. Um, the scheduling has become a major task. Some of them should actually employ an events manager that would make their lives easier because um, in the meantime, a lot of these families have spread out across the globe. So everybody's waiting for cousins to come back from the States, from Australia, from uh, 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 Germany, from France, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so these become these, these family um, uh, times in Calcutta, they are not the re Unite family reunions that are very much described, for instance, in terms of in, in the case of the transnational Caribbean families. They are just like extended periods of time where you have separate visits. And why is that the case? The, because, first of all, October, uh, October, November, December is not the, ti the time of a major festival in Carvela, so it's not like a big get together type of thing, except there, if there is a wedding. Um, so, in that sense, there is not a real kind of occasion where you could say, like, oh, this is our big Bengali festival, which is in Pujas in the beginning of, of, of October. Um, but also because um, you really play out middle classness in these kind of flats that you have bought, right? So you invite um, Aunt Monica with her husband for a, for, a, for, a, for a meal, yeah, or for drinks, or for coffee, and they come and maybe their children come, but then the next day you invite the next couple, and so on and so forth, yeah? So um, you don't do massive kind of loud gatherings that were a thing of the past. Also, and that is important here, a lot of the German spouses would say, we do it the German way, this is now our house. We don't have uh, to obey to the laws of our <laughs> in-laws anymore, or of my sister-in-law, as much as I love her. And we do it like that, we do it this way, okay? So we will not do a massive Indian meal, we will do kaffee and kuchen, which is cakes and coffee. Um, we will have people over for drinks, which is very important because of course in the houses, in the homes of um, senior relatives, you are not expected to drink alcohol very often. So, for instance, was always a space that her husband's cousins, and there were hundreds, uh, would love to visit because they could just drink free because he was known to like a drink and um, they could t then join him, yeah? But when they made an arrangement to meet in Artie's flat, that was off the cards, yeah? So again, you know, you see middle class lifestyles here becoming very much part of how um, this, this domesticity, as I would call it, uh, works in both sides. Now, um, the, uh, let me just see, yeah, sorry, 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 yeah. The, the second really important part of those ritualized visits is the question of investment. First of all, of course, buying a flat in India is a long drawn out process. Yeah? The stories of how we got to this apartment, they can last for like 10 hours of tape <laughs> because it's very complicated. There are a lot of players involved. You have uh, real estate developers, of course. First of all, you have the state enabling them, anyone to actually have a plot, build on a plot, building plans and so on and so forth. They have all been modified in order to make them. Secondly, you have the developers, right? The developers are the investors, so to speak. Many of them large, but most of them actually quite small scale. Yeah? This, this bigger development that I showed you there is not the, it is the norm in that area, but actually a lot of these people invested in smaller blocks, blocks which are like by a neighborhood guy who had a plot, divided it, and built like four stories. Yeah? Um, very much a way of engaging with, for the men in particular, with their past, with connections that they had. Again, you know, the homemaking process um, draws on older connections, but also reinforces those older connections. Yeah. So you have a classmate, you know, who lives in the States, and he sells two flats that he built on his plot. Yeah. You're likely to at, le at least look at them and then negotiate with them. Yeah. Again, the home is not just a that space is also the process of actually physically creating those ones. Then there is the negotiation with the local bank manager. And again, you know, you draw on all these kind of existing but also new kind of connections. Your cousin's son now is the bank manager. Good luck, the, good uh, luck. Mm -hmm. lucky you that you kept in touch with them, right? Because he's mm -hmm. going to give you a good loan, and so on and so forth. Yeah? So the attachment to the city 
translates um, over, over decades, translates actually into being inserted in that narrative of in our eyes remaking the city and remaking India and investing in India in all sorts of things. Another thing that happens here is of course, um, and that again makes this into a kind of diaspora, um, I would argue, is the fact that a lot of these men, because they are engineers, and because you know they have some capital and they have connections, they fe felt, feel as some of them are not in their 80s here, but felt very strongly that they should invest in it, okay, as in beyond the home. So in these flats, a lot of negotiations took place where guys came and like, you know, with their cousin or class batchmate from university would negotiate, like, let's have a little engineering company outside the city, somewhere in the sticks. Yeah, we are going to extract, so to speak, you could argue, you know, we are going to extract that capital from uh, that small steel, steel uh, aluminium thing, uh, uh, workshop, that's the word, workshop in Durgapur. Yeah, we are going to provide the German know-how, we are going to manage that, and we are going to extract that, uh, that uh, profit from there, but also we are going to give people work, and so that's the kind of narrative that happens here. Yeah? So the homecoming is not just about the feel-good factor of us sitting there with our relatives, um, it's also that the relatives, in the broadest sense, kin and friends and so on, relationships, are used to make that into actually something that is worth your while. Yeah? A lot of these joint ventures, they would always talk about joint ventures, fail, complete failures, total failure. Yeah? They, they just don't work. And a lot of the narratives around that are, we thought we could do it because India had changed, but we then found that it didn't change. Yeah? The red tape is still there, the people still don't want to work, and so on and so on. That is um, a next, I think, quite important part of that kind of homemaking is the, the dis disenchantment with, with that project to a degree. The fact that when you actually go through that process of building that new second home and make that part of your life, is not only that it becomes a shed full of work, yeah, that suddenly you have to manage two homes, right? You know, you have to, the loads to manage. There's constant, constant running to, to, uh, to, to the bank, to the, to the, uh, to the government, so there's always, and, and not, not, don't get me started on builders, there's always something to do, right? So you're no longer just visiting, you're constantly working as a pensioner couple. But also the fact that um, actually these homes um, are designed and perfected because you are a German engineer, but after all, like you are a German Indian, so they are appropriate standards. Yeah? The men spent enormous amounts of time personally supervising builders. Yeah? Standing like right behind this guy and telling him what to do. Yeah? The women spent enormous amounts of time to train servants in the German way. So there is again, you know, this agreement that, you know, um, not only is there a resurrection of particular patriarchal values, this is very much infused by narratives of uh, difference, very much class difference. Yeah? Um, but also race difference. Yeah? Because whatever is German is of high standard. Yeah? Some of them went so far as to import, I thought that was the craziest thing ever, import all the um, tabs from Germany because they couldn't get uh, uh, proper tabs. That was a complete failure, of course, like all these projects, whether it's a steel plant or a tab, because <laughs> stuff that you import into India tends to not work in India. But um, it was a good act. Uh, yeah, I, I watched that with great interest <laughs> and of some kind of, you know, um, so the, this uh, homes also become sites where you can actually display superiority, yeah, where you can kind of make status out of your migration history by transferring supposed knowledge, by, sub by, by uh, transferring home management yeah, from abroad. And of course there's a long tradition of that in India that starts with the British women who become mistresses of the house in India and there's a long, exactly the same narrative about that. Right? Then actually, you know, we have to civilize these people, we have to domesticate these people, the domestics have to be domesticated properly, <laughs> and, um, and um, <clears throat> that, that actually knowledge and standards are something that is something that is from outside, yeah? that you carry within you because you embody it and you know about it and you can articulate it, but it is from outside. Yeah? It's not from India. Yeah? Um, that is a narrative that a lot of the middle class generally would actually support. So that is not something that is strange to them, right? Um, 
it's particularly, and I'm sorry to say that, um, it's particularly associated with Germany, especially Calcutta, for all sorts of complicated cultural reasons and, and political reasons. Um, so anything German used to be superior, like our cameras, and people would kind of confront you with, with things that you have never seen, and they would ask you, like, can you repair that? Uh, or can you look at that? Do you have that too? And a lot of it was from East Germany, and I stared at it, and I thought, like, what the hell is this even? <laughs> but there is this whole narrative of those standards, um, which is now, of course, um, mixed with global ideas, ideas about global lifestyles. So that is really important. Another thing that I think is really interesting is that um, these apartments are, of course, no longer sites of, ex of these exotic for the kin who are related to those couples, right? Because these kin have now also very often good jobs, and they travel. Yeah, they have been to Europe. They have spent three months sitting there with their aunt in near Cologne. Yeah, so what has totally changed is the relationship of those local kin to those um, second homes. Right? They are not the, um, the, 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 the sites of exception, so to speak, yeah? where there is a space that is slightly abnormal because it's not totally overcrowded, because it's differently organized, because it's probably differently um, uh, decorated. A lot of those kin have now similar ideas about how they want to live. And in that sense, there is this collective kind of tying into global lifestyles and making that success story really real in homemaking, in what Sandra Srivastava has decided, a bathroom, uh, described as bathrooms and kitchens for the nation. So there's a broader project here again, you know, that is not absolutely not about those particular couples or about just migration. But migration plays a huge role in that. First of all, because it provided the blueprint earlier on. And secondly, because it becomes that possibility that you think about. Yeah? What I mean by that is that in these middle class families, very often the children are brought up to probably become migrants. Yeah? So you give them the right education. You give them what is very often referred to with the English word exposure. Yeah? So they learn how to, to consume particular things. They are groomed into becoming supposedly global workers, but also global consumers. Yeah? And that has really changed very much. There is hardly anything in Celia's flat now, yeah, which is full of like weird and wonderful things that she brought probably 20 years ago. A lot of them she tried to dump on us, and we said, like, no, thank you, we don't want your herbal tea that you brought in 79. <laughs> but, uh, you get, but nobody here wants it. They can all buy it now. Yeah? So in that sense, there is a kind of equalizing movement that happens here, and I would argue that that really makes for um, the broader context that there's a hegemonic yeah, formation here that is a global middle class lifestyle that has regional regional uh, touches to it, but very much the, I, a lot of the values, a lot of the, the ideas, a lot of the way that these, uh, these uh, processes are internalized in, per, in persons, but also socialized, so to speak, yeah? distributed across different social sites, happen in these middle class homes. Yeah? And I don't think that any one of you would have the slightest problem, and no matter what your background is, to find your way around that home. It doesn't matter. Right? So the specificity, so to speak, lies in the way that it works as part of an extended local middle class culture, but it is not specific in itself. Does that make sense? Yeah? Um, this is, is, you would find that in Egypt, you would find something very similar in Latin America. You know, so in that sense, this is absolutely not specific. I'm, and I'm not claiming that. OK. We've covered this. Yeah. So um, what, therefore, part of that paper is about is that these second homes are a way of investing and tying in with all those global discourses on liberal classness and so on. But also, they are materializing this sense of dual belonging. And of course, that is shared um, between the couple, where, and I think that is an interesting bit here, the, the female, the, 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 the wife, does not necessarily also have to, to belong to the city in the same way. She becomes part of that sense of belonging. In other words, I would argue that we need to pay attention to the fact that a migrant is not a singular person in that sense. It's, it, that person is always only to be imagined as part of couples, of families, of networks, of friendship, sites, and so on. Right? And if we go and interview only, yeah, we very often lose sight of that. 
if you interview one of these women, or if you have interview one of their husbands, you will probably say, oh, you know, she feels like that, and he feels like that, and that is the experience of that. But if you kind of hang out with them, and if you take into account that a lot of that is about material as much as I don't, the physicality of this space, but also the, 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 the lasting impact that a house has as opposed to a book or a song or a, or, or a madeleine. Yeah? <laughs> because you cannot take it back to Germany. Yeah, you cannot take that apartment back to Germany. Yeah? Then I think it's really um, about them, these apartments being important to them because they become that site of dual belonging in a different way than the house in Germany does. Okay? Um, now, I'm not kind of just inventing that. That is very much part of new thinking in anthropology on property and property relations, um, where again and again, some of the more interesting thinkers, I would argue, say that actually there is a difference between different kinds of property, and particularly houses, yeah? Not houses, but houses, yeah? Have a very specific meaning in discussions around property. That's a long history, of course, of Marxists thinking about property and houses, but more to the point, because of their, 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 their massive um, anchoring in a place, right? Because it is so difficult to actually pack them up and take them. Because they need so many resources and so much input to actually make them happen. Okay, we can discuss that. Um, but definitely something to think about. Um, now, let me just see. Come here. Now, so therefore, I think we can actually think about this making homes in India, making these new homes in India, as a matter of engaging with the new India, as, as a matter of you know becoming part of the narrative of success of the uh, new middle classes, kind of driving that success and being beneficiaries of that success, and that's all fine. Um, I think it's definitely really worth to think about those homes here as elsewhere as investment, and what does that mean? When people say that to us, what does that mean, right? Um, what is this kind of investment? Is that the same for everybody? How does that fit in with ideas about neoliberal selves, of self-making, of you know, uh, futures, future orientations, which is very much part of middle class thinking about the world, yeah? Your children are an investment, your house is an investment, everything becomes an investment, yeah? Um, and um, also, of course, a, 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 thinking about those second homes as sites for multiple new engagements. This is not just about the past, although we very often are told that story, that this is nostalgia, they want to live in Kalkadami, no, it's not just Kalkadami, right? The returnees want to kind of pick up where they were left because they always had this sense of longing and there was this absence in their lives, yeah? It's really also about making new connections and this is, in, at this moment in time in India, it's quite explicit. This is not necessarily always explicit, but it is in India right now extremely explicit that we want to make something here and a lot of these connections are cast in terms of monetary um, value. Okay, um, so if we then think about the considerable, and I do think that even with affluent migrants, and I will count myself amongst them, the considerable rupture, the considerable effort that it represents to actually maintain those things and make these second homes, so to speak, yeah? Just because you are affluent, it doesn't mean that this comes easy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah? Um, then there is this question of um, what happens afterwards. That is a very contested question. That was a question that actually none of these informants in the world since interlocutors wanted to really engage with. Mm -hmm. Because in a way, it goes against the grain of middle class homemaking. Middle class homemaking is about transferring something to your children, yeah? And this is not going to happen here. So that was a very problematic question. And I, I, I really put considerable effort into kind of pushing that question because I thought it was interesting. And I had the chance to talk to some of the children as well who came to visit their mothers whilst their mothers were visiting India. Okay, so complicated. Um, and even the children found it very hard to actually discuss that, right? Firstly, because it was overwrought with a lot of sentiment. This was the place where they met their grandparents, they, they passed away, um, they had, had these childhood memories of being with the cousins and so on and so forth, yeah? But also because they knew that actually this would displace 
a lot of these patriarchal values that they had been growing up with. Yeah, because this is what your father created. You can't just sell that off like that, right? So there's a whole storyline here, which is a non-finished story so far. Again, that would tie in with other stories of middle classness in India right now, where these parents are left behind, yeah, somewhere, and properties are empty because kids migrate, only that in this case it's more complicated because kids do not migrate to that place where they should migrate, which is here, yeah, and so on. Can you see how I'm trying to complicate that whole storyline that um, ties in with what you were talk talking about, that migration works in coming from Calcutta, being there, and then thinking about your aging parents in India. It is, um, oh, and property and all that is part of that, yeah? But here, this, this is then dispersed across different sites, and you have to take decisions, yeah? And lastly, and very interestingly, is the question of really, which is for me as a kitchen nerd, yeah? A question of integration and what is home for these women, these, these elderly women now, yeah? What happens to them? Now, within the joint family system in India, I'm just gonna gloss over this really briefly, there is this idea that a woman's place is never her place in the first place. Yeah. Because you are under, first you live in your father's place, then you live in your husband's place, then you live in your son's place. And there's a lot of complicated stuff that has to do with laws actually reproducing that. Yeah? So when you as a widow have a son and he wants you out of his house, then in, in many families, middle class families, I'm not talking some kind of rustics in the countryside, yeah? they will actually try and push you out, right? And they can very often push you out. And then you may start a court case, but whether you are gonna win that is a very different question. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so that is really, there is a very um, ambiguous and insecure relationship between women and homes, and I have written about this extensively on general property in India, yeah? Now, Property is one thing, but a home is a different thing because it's not just about who owns that home, who has a right in that home, but also actually physically, where are you going to reside? Yeah? Again, overlap here. Now, these German spouses, right, they have of course houses in, or homes in, in Germany, which nobody can take away from them. Yeah? But, very interestingly, some of them, not all of them, are not only considering, but actually did go to India in their old age because they felt that. Oh, you know, he has so many relatives around me, it's much cheaper to live here. Um, so they kind of say, oh, I still have my home in Germany, but in reality they spend a lot of time in Kolkata because that is the place where they feel that they are cared for in a different way. Very often their children within Germany migrated to different cities, so they're not available, particularly those who have sons. Again, you know, there's this kind of patriarchal subtext. And they become pensioners, and that is something that we see across India in different variations, um, they become pensioners in a place that is actually, if you so will, um, not their own, but which they choose, and in that particular entanglement here, in quite a surprising man manner, I would argue. Right? So it's very interesting. That doesn't always work out. A lot of that doesn't always work out. Yeah? So the whole story is, again, not one of arriving. It's a story of, you know, doing things, making arrangements, and then seeing whether they actually work out. So you may do that from your 60s to your 70s, but in your 70s then a lot of stuff happens health-wise and so on, and it's probably a wise decision to move on. And in that sense, I, a lot of them would emphasize the, this experience of non-permanence of these middle-class homes, which is probably something that a lot of global circulating middle-class people in this room will share. Yeah, that it's always renegotiated in accordance with <laughs> very mundane things. Yeah, space, health insurance, taxes. Yeah, grandchildren. Very important. Like I have these what I call the, the circulating grandparents. Yeah, grandparents who are like used in their sixties as child carers, especially in the states, who bitterly complain to me about that. Yeah? <laughs> why do I? Why do they ask me to come to bloody Texas where I don't know anyone and I'm stuck in the suburb? I don't. I don't want to go, but I have to because I have this. Uh, obligation, yeah? So very complicated kind of negotiations that go on. And then in your 70s, what becomes important is very often really the proximity to doctors. How, what is the relationship? And again, that's a whole different middle class story in India because doctors are very important in the everyday life of families. And I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you.